Hello, I'm Stephen Baker. It's my pleasure to bring to you today's Bible devotional. Thanks for joining me. Trust that God will bless you through his word today. Now we're thinking today about Psalm 119 and we're actually considering the references from verse 113 to verse 128. So it's kind of broadly two sections of eight verses and one is about respecting and revering the word of God. The other is about requesting God to protect and vindicate those who keep his word. But let me read a little bit of it to you. I hate vain thoughts but thy law do I love. That my hiding place and my shield I hope in thy word. Depart from me ye evildoers for I will keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according unto thy word that I may live and let me not be ashamed of my hope. Hold thou me up and I shall be safe and I will have respect unto thy statutes continually. Thou hast trodden down all them that err from thy statutes for their deceit is falsehood. Thou puttest away all the wicked of the earth like dross therefore I love thy testimonies. My flesh trembleth for fear of thee I am afraid of thy judgments. And then verses 121 down to verse 128, the psalmist here says, I love thy commandments, in verse 127, above gold, above fine gold. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. The psalmist here is reminding us in these verses that he loves God's word. He's reminding us that his hope, his strength is in God's word. He says, I hope in thy word. He's assuring himself and God that he's going to keep the commandments and God's word will uphold him. Hold me up, he says, and I shall be safe. Do you know God's word is the only strength we have in the varying and difficult circumstances of life? So he says, hold up. I'm going to be upheld by thy word. And then he talks about continual respect. He continually respects the word of God and he thinks about the deceitfulness of those who ignore the word of God and disobey the word of God. He loves his testimonies. He reveres the scriptures. But when you come to the next section, he looks for vindication. He says, I, I've done judgment and justice. Uh, and he says to God, please don't leave me to those who would victimise me. Maybe we sometimes feel, Lord, we need help. We need protection. We need strength. He says, my, my eyes are failing. I need the salvation of God. I need the word of righteousness. And he's pleading with God for protection and preservation. Maybe you feel like that some days. You need the protecting care of God. You need God's presence. You need to feel his strength and to know his presence. And so he appeals to the Lord. But isn't it wonderful that even when he's stressed and when he's feeling overwhelmed and when he's finding it difficult, he says, I love God's commandments above gold, even fine gold. It's more precious than anything else that the world could ever offer to me. And so we see something within these verses here, the wonder, the delight that he has in the word of God. Now, as we work our way through this psalm, we discover that the word of God is just light and life and liberation and freedom to the psalmist. And may God help it to be that in our experience as well. I want to tell you the story of a song that apparently was written at Christmas, but it never would strike me as a Christmas carol. It's the song His Name is wonderful. We used to sing it a lot when we were young people. Maybe you've sung it as well. Let me read you the words. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, master of everything. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God is he. Bow down before him, love and adore him. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. These words were written by a girl called Audrey Mir. She began writing hymns when she was about 16. She soon became a pianist and then a choir director. By the time she was 30, she had founded a choir clinic in the United States. The song His Name is Wonderful was written by her, but it was inspired as she went to her church's annual Christmas programme. 
Perhaps the programme at this particular church was not much different to many other churches or many other years. There was a little girl and she played the part of Mary, but she was very nervous. And the boys were supposed to be the angels and the, the, the organist played the Christmas carols in the background. And there seemed to be some unusual electric feeling, something excitable about the occasion. And when it was over, the preacher declared, it is wonderful. He is wonderful. His name is wonderful. A number of times. Audrey went home and thought to herself, that is so true. She, scrot she, she jotted the words on the back of her hymn sheet or in the back of her Bible. And when she went home, she wrote the words of this song so that those people in her church could sing. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, he is the mighty king, master of everything. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, he is the great shepherd. He's the rock of all ages. He's the almighty God. Isaiah reminds us of that in chapter 9. So we must bow down before him, love and adore him. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. Isn't it great to be inspired to appreciate the wonder and the beauty, and the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ? We're in the book of Acts chapter 20 and the Apostle Paul has had to leave Ephesus because of the dramatic events that took place there. The, an uproar took place and Paul called the disciples afterwards. He embraced them. And the Bible says he departed to go into Macedonia. And when he was gone over those parts, he gave them much in exhortation and he came to Greece. So Paul is traveling and preaching and encouraging and helping the believers to be encouraged in their faith as he travels. That's a great thing to be doing. Now, he waited there for three months in Greece. And when the Jews who were waiting to trap him, um, they, 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 were, they were looking for a way to, to attack him and to, well, kill him, actually. There was a plot to kill Paul, but there was a whole group of them. I'm reading in Acts 20, verse 4. that accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timotheus of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus, these going before tarried for us at Troas. So here is a group of men. We're thinking about characters in the book of Acts. Men who supported and strengthened the Apostle Paul as he travelled and preached. Well, they got to Philippi, uh, to Troas, sorry, and they sailed away and they came to there and it took them five days to get there. But what did they do? They waited for seven days. Why did they wait for seven days? Well, I think they waited to break bread. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them and they waited a whole week so that they were with the Lord's people. Now, many of us have had periods over lockdown when we haven't been able to break bread and that's been difficult. It's a great thing to break bread with the Christians. It's a great thing to remember the Lord Jesus. But that particular night, Paul preaches and a young man called Eutychus, he's exhausted and he falls into a deep sleep. And Paul preaches for a long time. He's long preaching. And this boy, he slouches down and falls from the third loft. And they thought, well, I think he had died, actually. He was taken up dead. And Paul goes down and he falls on him and embracing him, he said, trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. And this young man, he either was brought back to life or Paul identified that he wasn't actually dead. But they brought him back up and they ate a meal and they talked a long while till the dawn came and then Paul departed. This is a very interesting little incident in the book of Acts. When Paul travels with his friends, waits to meet the believers and break bread. A young man has a tragic accident, but thank God his life is preserved. And then Paul travels further on his journey. It's a wonderful thing to read these little accounts. They're real life incidents in the experience of the Apostle Paul and God was with him and God blessed his word. May God bless you through his word today. Well, it's been good to have your company today and I've been privileged to be able to teach publicly and from house to house. God bless you today.